thanks for joining me today for this session, which is about reduce cost by moving to AWS storage. Welcome again. My name is Disha Kamra and I am AWS solution architect and consultant here in Decode, uh, Decode Cloud Solution. So today we are going to provide you some detailing over on the following topics, which we are trying to cover within 45 minutes and maximum 50 minutes in the session. So the objective of today is to discuss to provide you what are the business driver or I can say the use cases where organizations are deciding for migrating to cloud. How we are going to identify how you should actually identify your data storage requirement. What are the various AWS storage services available and how you can optimize each one of them? Some of the best practices which are shared by the vendor itself and what is the ongoing process and how you should lead them. So basically organization tend to think of data storage as one of the service and do not optimize most of the time after the data is moved to the cloud. Many also fail to clean up unused storage and let these services run for days, weeks, even month at whatever cost is coming to that. And it has been observed up to 7% of cloud spend is wasted on unused storage volumes and old snapshot. So AWS offer a broad, broad and flexible set of data storage option that you move between different tiers of storage and change storage types at any time. So this session is going to discuss how to choose AWS storage services that meet your data storage need at the lowest cost, and we will also discuss how to optimize these services to achieve balance between performance, availability and durability. So here you can see these are the various use cases where an organization is deciding either to move moving or migrating to cloud. Like they are looking for a digital transformation. I worked with a client and they are like they are using, they have uh, their own cloud in infrastructure available, especially the banks uh, to the Europe, and they are deciding whether to go with AWS and Azure. They are evaluating the process, so they are in a process of digital transformation or getting into a staff production or improving their operational resilience and scalability and security, especially at the IT infrastructure front of. They would like to understand how they want, how they can go for a cost reduction and how going global quickly and merger and getting into a more detail so that they can save the cost. And of course, the world is moving way ahead. So we have a concept like Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, machine learning. If somebody is opting those technology and of course they will be moving to the cloud, then there are data center consideration. Cones are do, go, those days where people are holding, holding their own uh, data centers, their own uh, IDC servers, a place, a building to maintain everything and a huge team to maintain everything, to do a deployment, to upgrade the servers, servers, everything. But yes, cloud is a new era and how you can outsource changes and end of life. Of course, there is an end of life of hardware and software when we talk about the cloud environment. Now to optimize storage, the first step is to understand the performance profile for each of your workload. OK, guys, I have started and I believe uh, just a quick question before we move into the further things. I have enabled chat for you guys. OK, so I just need a very quick confirmation from all of you. Either you raise your hand or simply type it. Hope I'm audible and clear to you. I'm sorry being late a couple of slides asking this confirmation from you, but if you can please confirm very quickly. OK, and I hope I'm audible. My face is not I'm not running. I'm like you are able to understand me. OK, great. 
Thanks for the confirmation. So going back to our discussion here. So as I was talking about when we talk about the optimizing a storage, the first step is to understand the performance profile for each of your workload. Please understand each industry have their own way of working and they have a variety of workloads. It is you should conduct a performance analysis to measure your IOPS, which is input output operation per second throughput and other variable and how your AWS storage services are optimized for different storage scenarios. They are Please note there is no single data storage option that is idle for all your workloads and when you are evaluating your storage requirement, consider the data storage option for each workload separately. Now, these are some of the question which will help you to segment data within each of your workloads and determine your storage requirement. Let's say the very first. How often and how quickly do you need to access your data? So AWS offer storage option and pricing tiers for frequently access, let's frequently access and infrequently access data because there are time when you are working. Suppose your team, your marketing team is working on some of the data which has been very old even for one month or a year or five months. They just want to do some market analysis or a business analytic. So that is one of the cold data which is residing there. So AWS is giving you one of the offers which will give you to control your pricing as well. So we are going to see what are the various options available to you on what case in upcoming slides. Next question. Does your data store require high IPS or throughout? This is very important guys. You need to understand that what is your data store requirement? Is that moving to so AWS provides category of storage that has optimized for performance and throughout and understanding IOPS and throughput requirement will help you to provision the right amount of storage and avoid overpaying you. OK, next is. You should ask this question that how critical is your data? When I talk about critical, or a regulated data, it's need to be retained at almost any expense and it's tend to be stored for a long time, which means you may uh, you may have to archive that data and it's keep residing somewhere because you never know when that data is required by the business team or the team to get it to work. So that data is very important. So when you are keeping that data it, on a cold storage, of course you are looking for for a kind of a pricing which is like very reliable. So AWS is providing one of the feature under Amazon S3 that is Glacier. So we are going to see what are the various option, what are the various storage types are available and underneath what are other things. OK, next question. How sensitive is your data? Of course, this is very important. So highly sensitive data needs to be protected from accidental and any of the malicious chain changes, not just data loss or corruption. Here we are talking about how durable is your data? How durable is your service which is supporting that? Even the cost and security, each one of them are equally important to be considered. Next, how large is your data set? Now, it is important to know the total size of a data set help in estimating the storage capacity and cost. I'm not just talking about AWS platform. Even if you are evaluating other cloud environment, whether you are talking about AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud, Alibaba, there are so many options available to you. So you know what is the current size of your data and how that data is going to grow and what uh, what will be the uses of data in future? So accordingly, each one of them are providing you a calculator to 
give a cost estimation and you can see the beauty of a calculator there where you can just say, OK, this much of data I will be keeping on a frequently uses this much of data I will be keeping under the uh, the cold storage and the warm storage. So there is a three category of data which we are going to discuss in upcoming slide. So one is the hot data, then hot storage, warm storage and the cold storage. Hot storage is being considered when you have to frequently access that data, then so on. OK, so we are going to discuss that in upcoming slide. Other one is how transit is your data. Now transit data is short lived and typically does not require high durability. Please note when I say durability, it's referred to average and well expected data loss. So like Twitter data is a good example of translate data, OK, which maintaining a micro blocking and everything. Last but not the least, how much are you prepared to pay to store the data? What is your budget for data? How does the data storage will inform your decision about the storage option available? So these are some of the question one should consider in their mind when they are deciding that where they want to move, how they want to move. And I must say that all of these questions can be answered easily using AWS storage services. Now guys, what are the various uh, AWS storage services? Now choosing the right AWS storage service for your data means finding the match in terms of data availability, durability and performance. When I talk about availability, it is refer the storage volume ability to deliver data upon request means it is it should be available. Uh, it should not be like you are waiting for that data because when we talk about the different storage type and the various uh, category of S3 data, there the availability will be, play a role. The data which is immediately required, what is the availability percentages there as well as the performance refer to the number of IOPS or the amount of throughputs which we are ma measured on the megabytes per second. So Amazon offer three broad category of storage services, which is block storage, object storage and your file storage. Each offering is designed to meet a different storage requirement, which give you flexibility to find the solution that works best for your storage scenario. So the very first which is very popular. OK, that's the object storage. When I say object storage, what do you mean by object? I just need a little interaction from your uh, from you guys over on the chat. In a computer world, what do you call an object? A quick question, anything. Can I say a single file or a for, for folder? Anything will be considered as an uh, yes, the images file, even the folder. Those are my object. As simple right now, what you guys are doing, even if you are working on your project, even a simple file, let's say this PPT or a Excel file or anything. OK, so when we talk about this, so where are you storing? You are storing on your local machine or you're when you are storing even a single image. Either you are storing on somewhere. If you are using Microsoft, then you are storing on OneDrive. If you are using any iPhone or any of the Apple product, then you are storing there in iCloud. If I'm using if I'm using a Google product, then I'm using somewhere in the Google Drive. OK, same go for when we are talking about organization. We are talking about the organization where they are holding a different variety of data around them. And of course, that's something which we are considering. So object storage, Amazon simple storage service. That's the object storage category of uh, Amazon storage service, OK, which is known as S3. It's highly durable general purpose object storage that works well for unstructured data. Like when I say unstructured data, what do I mean by that? It's a media content or any of the file, any of the folder, a group of files uh, club together, anything, even as a format. 
So S3 provide the highest level of data durability and availability on the AWS cloud, and they are three tiers in the storage. As I told you earlier, one each for hot, warm and cold data, which we are going to discuss in upcoming next slide. The other one is the block storage. Now, what is a block storage? Um, you consider this is something if you guys understand the Linux platform or something like that, Ubuntu and all. So you may be able to understand, but I do not want to get into a detail right now. But please understand this is one of this is known as Amazon Elastic Block Storage Store, which is known as EBS. It's a volume which provide a durable block storage option, which is used with an EC2 instance. If you guys are coming from a Microsoft background and uh, something you know about virtualization, that's known as virtual machine. So virtual machines are equivalent to EC2 instance here in AWS. OK, so use Amazon EBS for data that's required long term persistence and quick access to the, uh, the level of to guaranteed level of performance. So EBS is attached to your EC2 instance. OK, the other category is the file storage, which is uh, your Amazon Elastic file system, which is also known as EFS. It's provide very simple scalable file storage for use with. You can attach the same EFS with multiple EC2 instances there. OK. Now let's move to the next slide, which is talking about more about the object storage, which is uh, Amazon S3. As I told you, it is highly durable general purpose object storage that works well for unstructured data, uh, the media content and all. And it's a high level of data durability. And as I heard telling you in my last slide, there are three tier of the storage, one each for hot, warm and cold data. So in term of pricing, when we talk about the colder the data, please guys listen, the colder the data, the cheaper it is on to store and the costier it is to access when needed. I'm repeating, which means if I am using my S3 bucket in the form of Glacier and keeping my data somewhere back, OK, of course the storage of data will be cheaper uh, comparatively to my S3 normal standard one. But if I want to achieve that, of course, one, it will not immediately available. It will cost me based on the volume which I have stored. And of course, it will take some time too. So you can easily move your data between the storage option, which I have mentioned. The standard is the frequently access. I is the different we are going to discuss now. OK, but if you want to move your data, let's say from standard to Glacier or vice versa anyway, then of course you can easily move your data between these options to optimize your storage course because it might be possible that the data which is important right now and to be accessed frequently uh, being given a uh, category of standard, but now that data has been like a kind of old data, which I may uh, get into when I need to do some data analysis and all. OK, so let's get into the details. When I talk about Amazon S3 standard, the best storage option for data that frequently access is S3 standard category. S3 deliver the low latency and high throughput, and it is idle for use cases such as cloud application, dynamic website, content distribution, gaming, and data analytics. You will be wondering, using this particular category, you can even deploy your static and even dynamic website using only two services of AWS. One is this S3 standard category, and the other one is your CloudFront distribution. OK, and using, of course, the Route 53 to refining the DNS and routing path and all everything. OK, uh, the other one is uh, Amazon S3 standard, which is known as infrequent access. Infrequent access name itself explain that uh, this storage option for data that you access very less frequently, such as long term backup, disaster recovery, and it's offered the cheaper storage over time, but higher charges to retrieve or the transfer data. OK, it's depend upon the volume of data you're trying to achieve from there. 
last but the least and guys i'm skipping some of them there are total five but these are the main three one which i'm talking about here and the last and not the least is the glacier it, it is designed for long term storage of infrequently access data such as end of end cycle data some of the compliance data or regular backup and different method of data retrieval are available at various speeds and cost so retrieval can take from few minutes to several hours okay now moving to block storage here now this is providing this is um, really s3 is still very easy that you are using a data the various category of data storage option is available to you but when we talk about ebs which is elastic block storage its volume provide a durable block storage option which is used for ec2 instances so using amazon ebs for data that requires long term persistence and quick access at guaranteed level of performance so there are two type of block storage one is the solid state drive which is ssd storage and the other one is hard disk drive which is hdd storage these are the common and simple terminology nowadays even we are using that in our laptop but to um, to explain it more when we talk about ssd storage it is optimized for transactional workload please guys remember when you are working on some of the projects on some of the workloads then transaction workload is it is opt it is basically uh, created for the transaction where performance is closely tied with your iop is where the response time is important for your business for your client and there are two ssd volume option to be chosen from uh, one is ebs provisioned iops ssd io1 which is known as this is best for the latency sensitive workload where you want your client will not be waiting for getting a response on a data or the whatever we are publishing on from that particular front end it's required specific minimum granted iop yes whether it is any of the ml machine learning or intelligent artificial intelligence app based application so with io uh, one volumes you pay separately for a provisioned iop yes so unless you need high level of provisioned iop yes gp2 volumes are better matched to the lower cost the other one uh, which i already mentioned it's a journal purpose ssd which is your ebs journal purpose ssd gp2 which is known as gp2 designed for journal use and offer a balance between your cost and performance other one is the hdd storage it is designed for throughput incentive uh, workloads such as data warehousing log processing and there are two type of hdd options available one the throughput um, optimized hdd uh, best for frequently access incentive uh, intensive workload and the cold HDD is designed for less frequently access and uh, the data which you are not going to use that frequently. Last one is our file storage. OK, the name of this service category, the storage service category is Amazon Elastic File Storage. This provides simple scalable file storage for use with EC2 instances and Amazon EFS support any number of instances at the same time. Its storage capacity can scale from gigabytes to petabytes of data without needing to provision storage and Amazon EFS is designed for workload and applications such as big data, media processing workflow, content management, web serving and Amazon EFS also support the files synchronization capability so that you can efficiently and securely move your file from on premises to the cloud file system which is EFS so it speed up to five times faster than the standard Linux copy tool Amazon S3 and Amazon EFS allocate storage based on your uses and you pay what you have used however for EBS volume you 
are charged for provisioned allocated storage, whether or not you have used it. So the key to keeping storage cost low without sacrificing required functionality is maximize the use of Amazon S3 whenever it is possible and use more expensive EBS volume with provisioned IO only when the application requirement is demanding that. Now we understand that what are the various form of uh, Amazon storage available? So we have discussed three Amazon S3, which is the object storage. Uh, we discuss the block storage, which is your EBS. We discuss about the file storage system, which is your EFS. Now how you are going to optimize them? Optimization of because as I given you a very uh, in the beginning an interaction that you have moved yourself into the cloud environment, but if you are not optimizing, if you are not maintaining, if you are not mon monitoring it, then of course you are, you will end up paying a huge bills to them. So AWS is providing you a various option to optimize. You should understand what are they, how you have to use them. So it lets you analyze the data access pattern, create the inventory list and configure the lifecycle policy. When I say lifecycle policy, especially in S3, if I am putting a bunch of data, an object there within my S3 bucket, which is a kind of a, you say, a placeholder of holding all of your object, everything there, okay? So you can create a lifecycle policy, okay? I know the life of this object of this data is only for 30, 60 or 90 days maximum. The moment it's achieved that number of days, it should move into either the glacier or in frequent access first and then moving to glacier. So you can maintain a life cycle policy at the time within that bucket that whatever this bucket is holding, whatever amount of data objects, I want that to keep on moving every 30 days or 60 days in the upcoming version of that. OK, so you can set up rule to automatically move data object to cheaper S3 storage tier as object are less frequently accessed by the application or your workload or by user or you can even say OK automatically delete this data because that is not so you can put the expiration date there to manage the data storage data more efficiently so you can use tagging uh, of course when you are creating an object and I'm sorry this session is not covering the basics we uh, assume that you have some basic knowledge about that so whenever you are creating any of the cloud, I'm not talking specifically about AWS or uh, uh, Azure or Google Cloud. Each one of the cloud environment, whenever you are creating your resources there, it's give you an option to tag them. OK, tagging is like a putting a kind of a bookmark there which will help you to identify or to monitor or to create a report. So to manage the storage data more efficiently, you can use the tagging to categorize your S3 object and filter them with this tags in your data lifecycle policy. So there are various options available. And to determine when the transition data to another storage class, you can use Amazon S3 analytic storage class analysis to analyze storage access pattern. Analyze all the object in a bucket or use an object tag a common. Please, uh, if you are new to this, uh, can consider bucket as a folder object as a file available in the folder file or folder. So when I'm saying and this tool will help you to analyze all the object in the bucket or use an object tag and common prefix to filter the object for analysis. If you observe infrequent access pattern of the filter data set over time, you can use the information to choose a more appropriate storage class and improve your lifecycle policy and make prediction around the future uses and growth. Another management tool is your S3 inventory. The S3 inventory which audits and report on replication and encryption status of your S3 object on a weekly and a monthly basis. This feature provide CSV output files that list the object 
and their corresponding metadata and let you configure the multiple inventory list for a single bucket and organized by different S3 metadata tag. You can also query your Amazon S3 inventory using the standard SQL by using Amazon uh, Redshift or other tool like uh, Apache Hive or Apache Spark and Scala. The last one, the Amazon S3 also publish your storage requests, data transfer metrics to your Amazon CloudWatch. The storage metrics are reported daily and collected within your Amazon CloudWatch. These are available at one minute interval for the uh, for the visibility and can be collected and reported for an entire bucket and subset of object. So with all the information, these storage management tool provide you and you can create policy to move less frequently access data, S3 data to the cheaper storage tier for considerable saving. For example, by moving from Amazon S3 standard to Amazon S3 standard IA, you can save up to 60% on per gigabyte basis of Amazon S3 pricing. By moving that data, at the end of its life cycle and access on rare occasion to Amazon Glacier, you can save up to 80% of Amazon S3 pricing. The other slide is comparing the one petabyte. I'm only talking about one petabyte of object storage. So the following table is comparing the monthly cost of storing one petabyte of uh, content on Amazon S3. Uh, I so you can see yourself here that if you are moving your how much cost you are going to save there. So it's say very clearly if 10 percentage of the content is excess per month, then saving would be like 40 percentage with moving your data from standard to standard infrequent access. OK, if uh, the same will go. If 50 percentage of your if 50 percentage of the content is accessed, the saving would be 24 percentage, which is still significant. Even if you are consuming some 100 percentage of your content is accessed per month, you would still save 2 percentage of using Amazon S3 standard IA. So to further optimize cost associated to storage and data retrieval, AWS announced the launch of uh, Amazon S3 Select and Glacier Select. Uh, traditionally, data in the object storage has to be accessed as a whole entity, regardless of the size of the object, and it will let you retrieve the subset of data from an object using simple SQL expressions, which means that your application no longer have to use compute resources to scan, filter the data from the object, Using Amazon S3 Select, you can potentially improve qu query performance by up to 400 percentage and reduce your query cost such as 80 percentage. So it supports the efficient data retrieval available in the storage form of. Now, with Amazon EBS, it is important to keep in mind that you are paying for provisioned capacity and performance. Even if the volume is unattached or has a very low write activity to optimize storage performance and cost for Amazon EBS, monitor volumes and identify one that are unattached and or appear to be overutilized adjust the provisioning to match the actual users. So AWS offer tool that can help you to optimize block storage. So Amazon CloudWatch automatically collect the range of the data point and uh, for EBS volume and let you set alarm on the volume behavior. And even AWS trusted advisor is another way for you to analyze your infrastructure to identify the unattached, underutilized, overutilized EBS volume. And there are some of the third party tools also available to get an insight of that. So the first one which I'm talking about is the delete unattached Amazon EBS volume. An easy way to reduce the wasted spend is to find and delete those volume which are unattached with any of the EC2. 
However, when EC2 instants are stops or terminated, the attached EBS volumes are not automatically deleted and will continue to occur you charges since they are still operating. To find the unattached EBS volume, look for the volumes that are available and that are not attached to any of the EC2 instant. OK, so this will help you and please ensure before you delete a volume or store and uh, just store an Amazon EBS snapshot, a backup of your EBS volume so that the volume can be quickly restored later if needed. You can automate the process of deleting the unattached volume as well after taking the snapshot using the AWS Lambda function, which will automatically run a process based on your definition after monitoring the Amazon CloudWatch. The other one is the resize or changing the EBS volume type. So this will help you to optimize the storage cost, identifying the volume that are underutilized or downsize them or change the volume type. Uh, you monitor the read write access of EBS and if you have current generation EBS volume attached to a current generation EC, uh, EC2 instance type, then you can use the elastic volume feature to change the size or volume type. So you are just the IPS performance without deattaching the volume. OK, so some of the tips I can give you like for uh, GP2, which is general purpose SSD volume, you want to optimize for capacity so that you are paying only what you have used. OK, you can save by reducing the provisioned IPS or by switching them to SSD volume uh, to a, or to general purpose. OK, and if the volume is 500 gigabyte or a larger, consider converting it to the cold HDT SC1. It will save you a lot of lot of charges which will be reoccurring you. You can always return a volume to his original setting if needed, but if you feel that a volume of data is just sitting there without getting any use of, it is highly recommended to convert that into a cold storage. Delete uh, the other one is delete sale Amazon EBS snapshot. See, we follow that backup policy most of the time and you do even on your on premises. There is a habit of taking a snapshot of your databases of your environment, everything. So if you back up, if you have a backup policy that take EBS volume snapshot on a daily or a weekly, you will see that you are collecting a lot of snapshot and keep on checking that over 30 days there are so many available to you and you can delete them to reduce use the storage cost. Deleting a snapshot has no effect on your volume. You can use AWS Management Console or command line interface to do so. Now, maintaining a storage architecture that is both right size and right price is an ongoing process. There is no second thought on that. To get the most efficient use of your storage spend, you should optimize storage on a monthly basis and you can streamline this effort by establishing an ongoing mechanism for optimizing your storage, setting up the storage policy. Uh, you can go and monitoring your cost closely using the AWS cost reporting tool like Cost Explorer, Budget, Detail Billing Report. There is an option available under your Billing and Cost Management Console where can you put a, a value and a threshold which will keep you informed and even defining your own policy. You can even uh, enforce uh, Amazon S3 object tagging and establishing S3 lifecycle policy to continue optimizing data storage throughout your data lifecycle. So that is all about a very quick introduction about how you can save your cost. These are some of the best practices which I have shared with you guys. OK, uh, we have five minutes in our hand and um, so if you have any question, you can type in here. And uh, this is our website. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and this video will be made available on our YouTube as well.